Good afternoon and uh, welcome to our Landscape Trees class. Uh, my name is David Rice with Weaver Basin Water Conservancy District and joining us um, is Janice Terry. She's a, our main horticulturist for our learning garden. And so um, if you're new to this format, some of you have probably participated with us in these classes, hopefully, and uh, hopefully you've enjoyed them. If you're new to this, uh, because of the nature of this kind of technology and, and the background feedback noise and so forth, everybody's muted. And the way we address questions is um, on the little control panel that each of you have, there's a Q&A button. If you would just type your question into that Q&A, um, then Janice will be addressing those and typing back answers. And then as we get towards the end, or if there's a break, to, you know, pause or something where Janice can interject, we'll address those along the way. But at the end, any questions that remain, we'll just verbally address all those questions and, and get your questions answered. Um, but we're grateful for you to join us today. Looking forward to, to going over some things related to trees. Um, one really quick note, we had a lot of good rain yesterday. So if your schedules are still set to irrigate, you can probably turn those off for a couple of days. With the temperatures the way they're gonna be, you, you probably not need to water anything um, at least through the end of this week as the temperatures stay down in the 70s, nighttime temperatures are cool and we had very significant rain. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And let me just, I'm gonna switch some screens here and, and we'll, we'll share, share the other presentation. Oops, bear with us as we always face various challenges with um, with our technology. So give me just a second and we'll, we'll get a different screen going here. Okay, come on. <clears throat> Sorry, it is just gonna take me a second to, there we go. All right, so today it's gonna be trees everybody can see that now and we'll go we'll go through this presentation and I'll there's some of these slides are text a little bit text heavy I'm going to kind of skim through them but for reference for anybody that wants to go back and see this presentation again or go through the slides on your own uh, the slides will be posted on our website as a PowerPoint presentation and so you can go and review the slides anytime and the webinar is also being recorded so if you would like to go back and watch certain sections of it or, or the entire webinar again, um, various discussion points or so forth, it's also going to be posted on our website. So you go to weaverbasin.com, go to the, the uh, conser conservation tab, and then classes and events tab, and you'll see the various things that are attached there for each class. Just look under today's date with the, with the title of Landscape Trees and you'll be able to see that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, give me just a second here. Oh, there we go. All right, so there's, I wanna go through some things about considering trees. Now trees are really important in the landscape. They're the, the kind of the backbone, the structure, and they're really permanent. Once you get a tree growing and going, it's, it's not movable like other elements of a, a landscape. Even shrubs to some extent are movable. You can transplant them, you can dig them up and move them. But trees become a very structural, very fixed, permanent, um, I shouldn't say permanent because you can always cut down a tree and plant a new one, but they become very structural and, and fixed in a landscape. So you, you wanna think about a lot of considerations when you're planting a tree, when you're selecting a tree. And so we'll go through some of these considerations to help you hopefully select the best trees for your, your landscape and knowing what trees are, are going to be good for various conditions. The sides, we'll, we'll kind of focus on small trees, medium trees and large trees. And then again, the site considerations and a few maintenance type things, some uh, pest type things and so forth. But um, always, always think about these considerations. It, it's a lot more than just going to a nursery and say, well, that looks really cool, I'll throw it in without thinking about what this thing will do when it's mature. So it isn't rocket science though. So don't, don't try to overthink it. Don't try to do something and you know, it, it's going, they're plants, they're gonna respond. Not every tree is gonna be perfect. Even if it's described as round or oval, they, they have their unique growth patterns and everything else. 
um, but just enjoy it. So first, knowing a bit about your soils. Um, soil is really, really important in any element of landscaping. It, you gotta know what, what the soil is doing related to water, but also how is a tree gonna be able to grow into the soil? If it's loose, if it's compacted, what kind of drainage, if it's high in salinity. We have trees in our, that, that for our climate may not do as well simply because of the salinity of the soil, um, the alkalinity of the soil, the looseness of the soil, and how, how different your different nutrients and elements can tend to be bound in soils. Um, iron is one of those. You can get iron chlorosis in certain types of trees based on the soil chemistry. So really, really important. If you're worried about your soil, you can get a soil sample done through the USU Extension. Um, they, can, they can tell you every single thing about your soils. If you need to amend your soil, organic compost of any kind will help fix I shouldn't say fix, will help improve any soil texture or quality for water drainage and for water holding. It's weird how that works on both ways. If you lose soil, you add a compost for water holding. If it's a compacted heavy soil, you add it for loosening for drainage. Um, so the other thing to consider is the hardiness zone that you live in. Now there's a website, you can just do a little quick plant, plant hardiness. You can do a USDA hardiness zone map search and it will tell you, you can find one locally for the state and by city, it'll tell you what zone you're in. And when you go shopping for a tree, try to find a tree that's gonna be hardy to that zone. The lower the number on the zone, the more cold tolerant, uh, or the more cold it gets, I should say. And so if you get a zone three tolerant tree, of course it'll do fine in zone four and five and six and then on all the way down to three. But if you know how the, how the tree is being, how it tolerates heat or cold or, or any of those things, you're going to be more successful. You don't want to plant a tree that's marginally hardy and then next, and have a cold winter and the next year it's dead. Uh, the plant tags that you'll see at the nursery almost always have that information on them. They'll have water requirements, they'll have soil requirements, they have cold hardiness requirements. So always pay attention to that zone, zone quality. Um, the next thing to consider, and sometimes we don't think about this, is shade or sun tolerance. And because it's a tree, so most of the time you're thinking, well, they're all going to be in the sun and they're generating the shade. But some trees actually prefer to be in the shade. They like a little bit of pr pr protection from the hot sun, especially in our summers. We get some pretty intense heat, that hot summer sun on the south and west sides of, of structures. Um, some trees just don't tolerate that and they'll burn. Notice the picture at the bottom here, that's a that's Japanese maple with some margin burn. That's because it's just getting too hot. So some trees prefer a little bit of protection, some shade. They'll do better in those conditions where others just thrive in the heat and the sun. That will also be something that is on a plant tag. So pay attention to the tagging if, it, if it's something that needs a little bit more protection. <clears throat> and then water requirements. Now each tree is gonna have a different water requirement. Each, I shouldn't say each tree, each type of tree. Um, some, some tree species are very drought tolerant and once they're established, they don't need any supplemental water at all, especially if there's irrigation nearby on a lawn or something. Um, if, if you do have a tree in lawn, your biggest problem might be too much water in many cases. Um, others have very high water requirements and, and some actually prefer to have very soggy soils. Um, you'd want to pay attention to that because if you if you have the rest of your landscape is more drought tolerant or, or you know, lower water and you get a higher water demand plant like a, you know a tree in that you're going to struggle with something and your tree will probably be you know, not as happy as you'd like it. So precipitation does not usually provide enough water for most tree tree species that we plant in Utah uh, because of our desert climate. So you're going to mostly pr provide some supplemental water. However, if you do want to go very low water, there are tree varieties and species that, that tolerate that just fine. It's just paying attention to the, again, the plant tagging and, and these requirements and how soils interact there. So overwatering does lead to a lot of tree death. Most nurseries will tell you that they see things coming back or they hear uh, plant death most always is more on the side of overwatering than underwatering. We just love our trees so much. We think they're dying and the symptoms almost always look the same. You're, they start to turn yellow, you think they're dry, so you water more, which just act, activates or 
you know, makes the problem worse. And so then you end up drowning your tree, especially evergreens, very susceptible to drowning. Um, <clears throat> another issue is pest resistance. You want to buy pest resistant tree varieties. Now, you sometimes think, well, how am I going to know this? Over time, there's been cultivations and, and varieties of a species of trees. So some of those have become more pest resistant or disease resistant. So, you know, for example, the poplar, in this case, it says the poplar is susceptible to stem canker and is likely to die. You know, if you know that, then you don't want to buy a poplar. You could buy a different tree that has a similar growth habit, like a ginkgo or something like that, where it's not going to have that same problem with disease. So there's like anthracnose and there's scab and there's scale and there's lots of things. Some of those are bugs, but some trees tend to just draw those bugs or the tree gets a little bit weak and then the bug infestation happens. So there are certain varieties and cultivations that are going to be much better on pest and disease resistance than others. So pay attention to that on plant tagging as well. And then stressed trees, if your tree is stressed for whatever reason, drought stress, overwater stress, heat stress, something, then those trees almost are always more susceptible to pest damage. And you'll start to see infestations of bugs or disease, bacteria, viruses, and stuff like that. So the other thing that's really, really important is the growth rate. Now, you're planting a tree and most homeowners work, well, I shouldn't say most, I think all of us, we live in a fast paced world where we can get things quickly. And so a lot of times where our expectation is we want to plant a tree and we want some shade in a couple of years. We want some maturity on this thing, but we've got to learn to be patient with trees. And if it has rapid growth rate, it is usually going to be a weaker tree. Uh, most weak wooded trees are fast growers. And, and so if you plant a willow, for example, or a cottonwood, they're going to grow very quickly and they're going to get very large very quickly, but they're weak wood. And so then you end up with breakage, you end up with problems, you know. Um, now, if you know that that's the case, then sometimes it's a good idea to plant a few slower growers with a few fast growers. You get some shade quickly, and then as the slower growers catch up, you can cut the others down and get rid of those. Um, but pay attention to how that growth is going to happen on a tree. And I'm going to, I'm going to get into some pictures here in just a second. We're going to start talking about specific tree varieties and, and the shapes and some of that kind of stuff. But this is really important considerations as you're thinking about trees. Always think about full size. So the, you know, the little tree at the nursery that just looks so cute, if you, if you don't read the tag on that thing, well, that little four foot tall thing or six foot tall thing may, may end up to be a mature tree of 80 feet tall and with a 50 foot crown top. Um, so knowing that if you don't have the space for that, don't put in a giant tree that's gonna cost you $1,000 to remove because it's hanging over your house or $3,000 to remove. Um, tree, tree removal becomes very expensive on very large trees that are over structures or over power lines or some of that kind of stuff. So if, if, they're plant, if trees are planted too close together, too close to structures, um, just overall tree health is going to decline. You need to anticipate the spacing that they're going to need and let, them, let the spacing be there, have that spacing available. If you only have a small space, it's looking for trees that have a small canopy. They're going to remain small so that they're going to be healthy and they're not going to be overcrowded or tight in the space they're in. Strong wooded trees and tree crowns can be allowed to overhang roofs. Um, but if you have a weak wooded tree, a fast grower, I would never recommend that they overhead hang structures because you get a heavy snow, you get a strong wind, inevitably large branches will break out of those trees and damage your structures. So um, here's just a couple examples of this, of planting trees too close to structures. Um, when you look at the one, it's, it's actually the eaves. It's grown right into the eaves. The eaves of that house are right kind of around the trunk of the tree. The other one's right at the foundation. Likely there's foundation damage there. Those roots can, can actually break apart concrete. So you'd want to be really careful about location, knowing the size of trees, how they're going to grow, and don't, don't do this kind of thing. Um, form, we'll start talking, we'll get into form, the shape of a tree. Oval shape, columnar shape, you know, really broad, lower, um, very important characteristics that you think about in decide, before you decide. 
you know, some people just love that weeping characteristic where a, a tree droops down and others really want more upright, very nicely shaped, you know, traditional round shade trees. There are vase shaped trees, there's, you know, pyramidal conical looking trees. Um, they, can, they can provide good function as well as form. And sometimes you want good screening, so you'd want more of an upright tree instead of broad. So always considering, again, the, these, these things to think about, which all kind of tie back into a, an original plan. If you, know, if you know what your plan is, what space you have available, then you can usually narrow down the, the types of things you need, and then you can go shopping at a nursery and start finding the form you need. If you go to a nursery and say, oh, I'm looking for something that's a little more upright that only gets 10 feet wide, well, then they can show you the trees that they have available that are only 10 feet wide. And then you can make a choice from there. Because sometimes the tree varieties are changing all the time. And even in this presentation, I'm not going to have all of the trees that are available at nurseries in this presentation because it's changing and there's some great things happening with different cultivations and so forth. So here's just a little, just a little chart that shows kind of the types of shapes. That, that can help you determine, you know, here's the kind of tree I like. I like a little more upright, oval, a nice, most evergreens, not all, but your typical evergreen is kind of a pyramidal shape. So if that's the kind of structure you're looking for in a landscape, can maybe accent something. Um, if you need a shade tree, a big shade tree, and you're gonna wanna hang a swing from it, you probably want something more spreading uh, or something like that. But anyway, this will help you give a little bit of guide of how those tree shapes look. All right, so another character, another thing to consider is root, rooting area. Um, it's just as important as the crown space. And I'll show you these pictures for an example. Um, roots can grow, they will grow, they need to grow. The tree, unless you put it in a pot, in you know, bonsai is an example, is I guess you put something in a pot and you're trimming the top and you're, there's no room for the bottom so everything stays really dwarfed and small, but in most cases, when you've got a landscape and you've got, you plant a tree, well, there's room underneath to grow, but what are, what's around it is going to be affected. Look at the picture with the sidewalk lifting, um, you know, the, the roots of this tree and the pavers. Roots will tend to just keep growing because they need space. So always know the, what this tree is going to do. And a lot of times the plant tags will also indicate if it's a shallow rooted tree, not always, sometimes you have to do a little bit more homework if it's a more shallow rooted tree or a deeper rooted tree. Um, but in most cases, always think about they're going to need plenty of space. Rooting sometimes goes to the, the canopy edge. So if the top is 12 feet away from the trunk, you probably expect roots to be at least 12 feet away from the trunk, if not more. Um, but I would recommend never planting large trees in park strips between the curb and the sidewalk because of this very thing that you see in the picture. You'll always get concrete lifting. Um, so focus on small trees in those areas, put large trees where they're gonna have plenty of room to, to grow and expand and that, that root collar even lifts out of the ground a little bit as those things mature. And then considering the longevity of a tree. Most of the time we're planting trees because we want good shade and longevity and you know it's your grandkids and great grandkids and whoever owns the house later they're going to benefit from the trees you plant today. And most typical good suburban trees in the neighborhoods might have a growth expectancy of 30 to 50 years, unless they're those weak wooded trees, willows and poplars, and some of those have a very short life. Some of those may be down to, you know, five to 10 years. I think the average lifespan of a poplar is somewhere in the 15 year range. They're going to get really big, they're going to, they're going to grow, and then they're going to start dying, and you're going to have to start taking them out. Um, so consider the longevity that, you know, as this thing keeps growing in 20 years from now, it's going to be a giant mature tree and uh, you need to be able to, to handle or plan for that life expectancy and longevity of that tree. And then kind of getting close to the end of this, the final things is your ornamental characteristics. Are you looking for something with some spines on it or fruit or flowers or certain textures or color, you know, the winter color, the fall color? Those things are important as well to be considering. There are trees that create an odor. You know, they're fragrant or I should say stinky, but they create an odor. Um, there are some that have root sprouts. There's some that send up root suckers. So it's considering the characteristics of, you know, the ornamental value as well. And if you think about this, 
I've gone through a whole bunch of things. That seems like a lot to think about. Generally speaking, it's just in your mind or on some paper as you have a plan, you're thinking, I want a flowering tree that's fairly small. I'd love to have pink flowers. And you write that list and then you can easily go and find a tree that fits that kind of characteristic. Now, I'm gonna show you also here in just a minute. Um, I should have started this at the beginning. Let me do something really quick here. Um, I wanna share with you the USU Extension web um, tree browser. Before I get into some other trees, I'll forget about this. So as you thought about your characteristics, here's a website, it's called Tree Browser. If you just go treebrowser.org, it's the USU Extension, um, it's on their site. Anyway, here's a little help for you. So in this search bar, as you see my screen, you can, you can type in a specific search or you just go to search characteristics and you can see growth. You can, you, know, you can type in a hardiness zone here. You can type a type of tree, a broadleaf, a conifer, any. You can type in what kind of, if you know the family names of trees, you know, if you're thinking I really want a birch tree or you know, a dogwood or something, um, an oak. And then I gotta scroll down here. You know, you, you can type in growth rates. I want a growth rate that's low and let's just do a search from that. Oops, I gotta scroll down here again. So I put in the oak family with a, or oak or beech family with um, a slow growth rate and here's what I get. American beech, European beech, you know, here's all the oak, three oaks that they have in their database right now. These are gonna be slow growers and, and meet some of the characteristics I put in. So anyway, this is just a really good tool you can sort by all kinds of characteristics here. So remember, just as whatever you put in, if it's in their database, it'll find some trees that fit that. So I just wanted to show you that as a little tool to help you maybe select some characteristics. And then once you click on, let me go back to one of these. Let me just click on this American beach. Once you click on one of these trees, it shows you, well, it doesn't show a lot of pictures, but it gives you this description and all kinds of good information here about the, the characteristics of that tree. So it'll tell you about the wood, it'll tell you about the bark, it tells you about the leaves, the twigs, the buds, and so forth and so forth. So again, that's treebrowser.org, and that's a good help. Um, it's not 100% it's not comprehensive. Every tree is not gonna be in there, but it is a good help that will, that will kind of guide you um, into finding, you know, finding some trees and finding some things that, that might help you fit the space you need to fit. All right, so continuing on, this is again the characteristics. So notice spines. In the picture on the upper left, it's got some thorns. Hawthorns have long thorns. Locusts have long thorns. Um, sweet gum have a spiny fruit. Um, there, there's lots of, lots of trees that have some, some sort of unique characteristics, but if you know it, this is, a this is a tree you want to plant that's a decent enough tree for kids to climb, well, you want to avoid some of these things, right, that have thorns. If you ever planted a Russian olive, they're weeds, but if you had one, very thorny. Um, so just considering those characteristics. Other characteristics are fruit or seed pods. Um, the, you know, the crab apple, the, the maple there, the European mountain ash fruit there on the bottom. So thinking about the season and the color, you know, you're gonna develop fruit later, but you're gonna have the flowers early. Those are some things to consider. If you love to feed birds, you think about a type of, of a tree that might have fruit that hangs on a tree. It's called persistent, persistent fruit. The birds come and eat those through the winter. Uh, all these great characteristics. And you know, when you think about flowering, what kind of flowers? Flowers like on the golden chain tree or the yellow wood that, that dangle down, like these little panicles of flowers or tight clusters of flowers as like the flowering pair, just tons of little flowers together or bigger flowers, kind of the prairie rose has nice big roughly flowers, prairie rose crab apple. Um, so again, all these types of characteristics are things you can look for and then you'll know this tree will look this way at this time of year. It's gonna be covered in blooms in the spring and it's gonna have brilliant red or brilliant yellow fall color. And then in the summer, it's, it's just a nice green tree. You know, those are the kind of things you're considering and thinking about as you do this. 
Um, one really important thing too is utility locations. If you're planting trees, always call blue stakes, um, have them stake so you don't run into anything when you're digging. And when you're digging by hand, usually you're not gonna damage most everything with a shovel, although you can easily cut through cable lines, phone lines, um, internet lines, stuff like that with a shovel. Um, the gas lines are less of a concern with a shovel. Electrical lines are always a concern because you can hit those. A lot of those are all in conduits and different things. You, if you're digging with equipment, no matter what, you gotta call. Most of the time in backyards, you don't have much of these utilities, but it's always a good idea to call because those utility companies come out for free. They mark everything that they have in the ground and then you can dig without worrying about hitting anything. So please always call and mark your locations before you dig to plant a tree. Um, another thing to do is notice you in the utility location, it's just noticing where things are. If, if you know there's some big power lines overhead, don't plant a big tree under those power lines because inevitably it's gonna come, they're gonna come up and create problems in those power lines and then power companies will come, they'll, they'll cut your tree. I mean, they, have a, they do a pretty good job at, at cutting them for the power line and you know doing proper cuts but then the tree just never looks like it should look um, so there's great resources for trees as well local nurseries are always great there's every city typically has an arborist and then the usu extension office and website there's lots of publications oh there's a city forester usually between an arborist and a city forester most cities have a person that they you can be referred to that'll help you with um, what the, especially in park strip areas, they, some of them have very specific lists of trees you can plant or can't plant. So always check with those sources of information to guide you in certain, certain locations. All right, so now we're going to just jump right into trees and tree sizing. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this list. So if you need to reference this, it'll be in the presentation. But this little chart here, just a copy of a spreadsheet, shows the botanical name and then the common name right after it. So Acer Janala is the Janala maple. And then it has the growth rate, the mature height, according to the books. Now in various sites, you can get variable size. So Janala maple is a typically a small tree. Sometimes at maturity, you might not see a 15 foot height. Maybe you'll see a 12 foot height. But depending on site conditions, some fertility, some, some different factors, there's always a range. So some of you might think too, some of these numbers look pretty big. 30 feet doesn't seem very small. Well, again, it's according to book, book things, some averages, different places of the country, different places where these grow. Um, but these are considered small landscape trees, at least if, and I, again, this is not a comprehensive list, but these are some trees that'll do well here. Um, so you got your mature height, you've got your longevity, as far as will these be long-lived trees, short-lived trees, so forth and then the crown shape. What is this gonna look like at maturity? So I'm gonna go through a few of these. I'm not gonna go through all of these and show you some pictures, but this will be something you'll need to come back and maybe reference if you're looking for a list. You can get on our website, you can come back and, and look at this list more in detail. Here's a quick overview of these trees with just common names. Okay, again, we're not gonna spend a lot of time here. So contorted filbert, bristlecone pine, these are a couple smart small trees. Now, I, I'm kind of mixing some specimen trees, trees with unique characteristics in with just others. Uh, because of time, I mean, we could spend hours and hours and hours, whole books, volumes have been written about trees. And we're just trying to cover this, you know, in a, in a quick hour to an hour and a half. So I'm not gonna have a lot of description, a lot of stuff, but I'm gonna show you some slides and pictures so contorted filbert, it's just the unique characteristics of the twisted branches, low growing, very unique. I think there's a variety called um, somebody, somebody's walking stick. I can't even remember now. Harry Lauder's walking stick or something like that, where it's just a cool contorted twisted looking wood. Um, very interesting. Bristlecone pines, very interesting structure. Not a very formal looking tree. It can get a little informal, but really interesting texture as far as the needles and how they go on the, on the branches. Um, you've got magnolia, which is grown for the flowers. And also most, some of the magnolias have just a nice glossy leaf. And they look really good. Red bud, just for the color. You've got lots of you know, vibrant color in the spring, a short landscape tree, suitable to some good sites and a small landscape. 
You've got paper bark maple known for its fall color, but then the peeling bark. So sometimes you're, you're looking for a characteristic that's interesting more than foliage, more than size. And so bark, a twist, a, a peeling bark or a dark bark that happens a lot on birches, um, the white barks on birches. Yeah, you, I didn't talk a lot about bugs, but there are some trees that are just susceptible to borers and problems. So again, pay attention to those things. But, but a paper bark maple is a fantastic tree, very few problems, but has a very, very attractive peeling bark. You know, Janala maple is mostly known for its vibrant fall color and even some color, colored seed, the colored, you know, seed pod. Not, not, they're not pods, the little seeds that come off of maples. And then the crab apples, they're just known for their vibrant color in the spring. Some of them have great fall color in the foliage. And then some of them, they're just, they're planted because they have the persistent fruit or they're fruitless. So they're not messy by any means, not like the old fashioned. Some of you maybe have an old fashioned crab apple or your, your you know, grandparents or somebody had a crab apple and it just dropped all those everywhere and made a giant mess. Um, most crab apple varieties now, the cultivations of these are just fantastic. They're not messy at all. They, they're just beautiful trees. <clears throat> Here's another contorted filbert picture and a, a thornless hawthorn known for mostly fall color. Uh, the berries that hang on the tree a little bit. The, actually, those berries will drop. They'll hang on there for a little while and give you some interesting color and then the birds come and eat them. Thundercloud plum, mostly the purple fall, or excuse me, purple foliage, not fall foliage, and the pink blossoms. Um, they have a fruit on them. They can, they can get a little messy. Spring snow crab apple, just the vibrant color of white. It's, I guess it's not really color, it's vibrant white. It's just a brilliant white. Um, it's called spring snow because when those petals fall off, it looks like a little bit of snow on the ground because it's just covered in white. Golden chain tree. Um, beautiful panicles of yellow flowers. Desert willow has these great big flowers on it. Kind of, the, kind of like a snapdragon flower. That's how I describe it. It's just a really cool plant. Now desert willow, I should mention, it's a little bit marginally hardy to our climate here. On a hard winter, the top of it will die back some. May not die back all the way. We've, we've, we've had some of these in the garden that have since been removed from construction. We had some and we kind of treated them like shrubs because they would die back in the winter and so we'd just prune them off, cut them right to the ground and then all the new vegetated growth would come up. They'd be about eight feet tall by the end of the summer and so we kind of treated them like a shrub that we'd just keep cutting down. Um, the problem with that is they didn't usually flower quite, quite as well or quite as much um, but desert willow is a really cool um, tree or shrub for, for northern Utah. And in the warmer zones you know, you'd do fine with a, a desert willow. They, I've seen one at Utah State on campus in Logan. So they're hardy enough to survive in a protected little microclimate on campus in Logan, which gets cold in the winter. So I've got a few other slides here, a little different format, but showing the same thing. Saucer magnolia, a good uh, small to medium tree. I, it almost falls into a medium. Some of these can get big. If you come from somewhere back east somewhere and you're used to magnolias, you don't see them a lot here. The ones you do see are beautiful, but they are, they're fairly small. They might only be 15, 15 to 20 feet tall. Um, beautiful flowers, big flowers. Um, they tend to freeze because of our, our frost patterns. So a lot of times they're flowering and then you'll get a frost and kind of damage the flowers, but, but the tree is beautiful. Here's a picture of the red, but I showed a little close up picture earlier. Um, just a really attractive spring bloomer. The, the blossoms are really small and tight to the stems, which so is covered in pink. Um, the foliage on these, you can, you can get kind of a purple burgundy foliage of these. Forest pansy redbud is a darker foliage uh, versus the dark, just the regular green. Uh, beautiful trees. They, are, they can have, they're not really known to have a lot of pests or bug problems or, or problems. Some people will steer you away from these because over time they can develop some, some problems um, and then you have branches that die out. Sometimes it's viral type virus, bacterial infection type stuff. But overall, it's a pretty decent small landscape tree for a residential yard. Throw Japanese maples in here. People love these. They are temperamental. 
because um, number one is a hardiness issue, cold hardiness, and the other is shade and protection. You cannot put these on the south or west, west side of a structure. They will simply just burn in the summer. And so most of the time these are best suited on the north side or an east side where they're getting protection from that intense summer sun. And, uh, and then they're also getting a little bit of protection from real cold. If you don't put this in a really you know, harsh windy zone from the cold winter winds or something like that. So a little bit of a protected mic microclimate, Japanese maples can be successful and do quite well. Otherwise they'll struggle. They'll burn in the summer, they may, they may die back or get some winter damage in, in the winter months. Um, but otherwise beautiful trees. If you like the maple, Japanese maple look, I don't have a slide of it in here, but a, a native plant here to Utah is uh, elderberry. And there, then there's a cultivations of elderberry, the purple leaf, kind of lace leaf elderberries. Very attractive leaf from a distance. Oftentimes people mistake them for Japanese maples. Not exactly the same structure or form, but, but some really unique look to a, like a lace leaf elderberry. So again, crab apples I mentioned already, there's lots of good varieties of these. You can look for fruitless or persistent fruiting, meaning they won't drop the fruit. And, and then there's a range. You can still find some medium sized crab apples that'll, that'll get 30 feet tall. A lot of crab apples, there's some smaller dwarf, kind of semi dwarf type varieties. They may only get 10 feet tall. Um, so, you know, as you're looking at nurseries, and like I said, everything in the nursery industry changes fairly quickly. So something that you may have seen five or 10 years ago, growers may not even be growing that one anymore because of new cultivations and so forth. So pay attention and go to the nurseries and, and look around, but don't ever feel pressure to hurry and buy something either. I mean, if you really, really love it and you see it, you may want to buy it because in, in two years, you may not see that variety again. But um, sometimes you can mail order these as well as bare root trees or, you know, there's, there's ways to find stuff sometimes, but um, anyway, some great all season trees for regular to small spaces, to small landscape trees. I already kind of talked about the Janala maple, there's the Tarian maple, small to medium, moderate growth, the fall colors, the seeds, soil adaptability. Overall, this is a, a you know, a great, a great tree to use in a, in a small landscape. Good strong wood, um, it's just, it's a good tree. Canyon or big tooth maple. Now this is one that's probably not used a lot and it's not in the landscape trade as much as it could be, although it's getting there. Now this is, a, this is actually a Utah native maple. If you've ever driven the canyon between Brigham City and Logan in the fall and you see all that brilliant maple color, those are big tooth maples. And so you, they're great landscape trees, small to medium, maples and um, they have a, a kind of a unique maple leaf shape um, not not like all maple leaves all of them have a little bit different um, shape but you you can you can find these you can find them as multi-stem trees or single leader trees and anyway you can you can find these in their great landscape trees if you can find them they do very well in dry locations very drought tolerant brilliant fall color <clears throat> so bosnian pine this is a smaller pine tree, zone four, small, slow growth, kind of a, not a typical conical shape, but somewhat it is. It's not a Christmas tree per se, but um, a great little pine tree. A lot of pines get very large. Bosnian pine is one that does not. So another thing you can think about too is um, go to nurseries because there's been a lot of cultivation um, on, on evergreens and different things where you can find a lot of small specimen trees that are meant for, for smaller residential landscapes. Our residential landscape size is shrinking. You know, where a lot, of, a lot of yards used to be an acre or half an acre, you're, you're now seeing yards at 0.15 or 0.11 acres. So the trees, you just can't plant a 50 foot tree in those spaces. There's just no room. But, but you can still get good evergreens. You can still have some nice trees and structure that are small. So check with the nurseries, whatever you like to shop. Because um, one example is Valley Nursery that's just close to where we work here. We went there once to look for some trees and they had some great little varieties and some new things we hadn't seen before of smaller evergreens. So they, they do really great. 
All right, so that kind of, I, I went through those quickly and that did not cover the comprehensive nature of small trees, but that was, that was some. Some of some small trees, it'll give you at least a start to start looking and getting a feel for what's out there. So let's go to medium trees. And once again, it'll have your growth rate, it'll have the size, it'll have how fast it, actually I got growth rate, growth rate on here twice. Anyway, no, that's the longevity. Moderately long, mod longevity, you know, long lived, and then the shape, broad to rounded or arching or so forth. Quick look again at the names, uh, just some common names. And so as you're looking through, if, you, if some of these names sound familiar to you, limber pine, you know, the, the ash, golden rain tree. I will, I should say, um, actually I'll get to it in the large trees. Never mind, we'll just, we'll just kind of move ahead. So Canada red choke cherry is a great medium tree um, that when it's growing, it'll send out new growths who have really bright green leaves that then turn burgundy as they mature as the, as through the course of the summer. Beautiful white and they are fragrant flowers on it. Um, so that's a, a nice addition. It's not messy like your plum, your purple plums and some of those that drop plums and birds eat them and poop all over the place. Um, although this does produce a little berry, it's not a messy tree. Um, I have one in my yard and I love it. It's been a great little tree. It's only a few years old. So it's now approaching probably about 15 feet tall. A very nice looking tree. And it's doing what I need it to do in the space that I've chosen. So your columnar hornbeam, and I'm, and I'm showing a couple pictures here. Columnar hornbeam gives you more the upright shape. If you have an area that maybe needs a taller tree but you don't have room for the broad size, then you're looking for columnar varieties. Uh, columnar hornbeam is a good one. There's columnar oak varieties that are great where you'll get 30 feet of height, but you won't have that really broad canopy. You might only have 10 foot of width, 10 to 12. You could put those along a fence for a screen, for either blocking something you don't want to see or that you don't want to see in, or for windscreen or something like that. Um, honey locusts. Now, I throw this one in there. Honey locusts are a good tree, but you want to be careful to look for a podless variety. Most nurseries are only carrying those, but if you're in the in the market for a honey locust tree, always just ask at the nursery, say, will this get pods? Can you make sure, you know, guarantee that this will not get pods? Um, the pods can be very messy. Um, honey locusts are not really a formal tree either. The one downside to honey locusts is they tend to have some interesting branching structures. The angles, as it, it comes off the trunk and the angles, they can sometimes have some really strong, strong, tight angles upright instead of a little bit more open that make stronger joints. So it makes a weak joint. And they can sometimes have crossing branches and stuff. But with a little care and a little bit of pruning early, you can usually shape those up to be really nice, attractive trees. A couple of evergreens that are medium for you um, is limber pine. Come on, I've got, I don't know if everyone can see that. It says move this window away from the screen or something. Um, so anyway, I don't know why that's there. So limber pine, we've got Korean pine, We've got um, the limber pine tends to be a little bit more upright. This particular picture seems to show it a little bit more loose. A lot of times limber pines are, are fairly conical, but they're not a tight conical shape. And they're called limber because the branches are very, very flexible. Um, and they are, we have a few of them here at our garden that are, I wanna say what, they're probably 15 years old. Going, well, going on that, 13, 14 years old. Um, Korean pine is a good medium medium pine tree, not going to get huge, like your ponderosa or your Austrian pines or some of those that are get just really big. And we've got I showed saucer magnolia in the small tree section, but it's also it's a it's a slow it's a excuse me it's a small to medium tree, so I put it in here as well. Beautiful trees. Now at nurseries. A lot of times you're finding cultivations of this and the cultivations actually do tend to be on the smaller side. Um, you know, there's the Ann, I think it's the cultivation of Ann and there's others that they're different colors. You can get white ones and kind of deeper purple. Um, 
I've had a hard time finding saucer mag, just a plain saucer magnolia when I've looked because I, I wanted one in my yard. Um, but they're a beautiful tree, well, well look fit for our climate. Bradford pear. Um, I've showed this one. I hesitate. It's a good tree, has good structure. See the upright? It's a little bit pyramidal in shape. These can get quite large. They're grown for the flowers and they're grown for the fall color. Notice the picture on the right, kind of the oranges to yellows. Quite brilliant fall color, but they, in my opinion, these trees stink, literally. The flowers just stink. Um, to some people, it doesn't bother them. To me, it has just a rotting, stinky smell. Um, so I would never grow one of these, although you see these a lot. Very common tree, good tree as far as structure goes. You know, there are a few pest issues and just different things with that. Um, but if you like that shape with that color and that fall characteristic, it's a good tree for that. Otherwise, I, I think there's some other options that give you some of those same characteristics like the crab apples. Certain crab apples will give you the same white color, same nice fall color without the stink. European mountain ash, um, really cool looking tree. Has cool leaves. It has those really brilliant berries in those big clusters. So you get that interesting look with those berries on it in the summer into later fall. Um, I just think it's a cool tree, not very used. It's underused as far as that goes, um, but it, it can be a fairly large tree. It, it's a medium sized tree. So that means you're looking at maybe a 30 foot tree, 20, 20 to 30, maybe a little bit taller, 35 feet, um, pretty decent sized tree. So you need the space for it, but it, 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 it's kind of a cool looking tree. Doesn't seem to have, it is in the ash family and ashes can have some bore issues, but that's more of the green ash and, and some of the others. Um, this one doesn't seem to have quite as many issues as some of the others. <clears throat> Golden rain tree is quite common, quite a drought tolerant tree. It produces the brilliant yellow flowers. Now this is an interesting one because it flowers in the summer, not in the spring. And then it produces, the picture on the bottom is it's this cool little seed pod. It looks like a little dried up lantern. And it's almost just as interesting as the flowers and they'll hang on the tree for a while. Uh, providing kind of this interesting look. But generally golden rain trees have a good structure. They're a good solid tree. They're very drought tolerant. You see these a lot of times in parking medians and, and areas around parking lots because they're a very tolerant tree of, of hard, kind of hotter, drier, maybe a little poorer soil conditions. And here's, here's that same golden rain tree again. A little different pictures, but just again mentioning it's kind of a small to medium tree, slow to moderate growth, July flowers, lots of some different varieties of that. Throwing river birch, if you have a site that is tends to be a little wetter um, or maybe it's sloped, water pools and you can't keep other trees alive, it's just too wet, then you might want to consider using a birch, a river birch. There's a, a native river birch that does really well here. It's a dark bark, um, moderate growth, has a, you know, not a, it has an interesting shape and texture. It's more pyramidal, more upright, kind of drooping a little bit. Um, it's suitable for just wet locations, really soggy places. You, they call it river birch because it grows up along rivers. Um, you'll see these, uh, if you've driven the canyons, like the one that stands out the most is Logan Canyon. You drive up Logan Canyon, there's river birches all over up there along the river. Um, I've already sh I showed you one of limber pine. Here's another one of limber pine, some four, medium, medium growth fast grower. Um, fast but not necessarily weak. Evergreens are slightly different. So, that, so as far as evergreens grow, it puts on a decent growth rate. Most evergreens are fairly slow. Sometimes they're only growing three or four inches a year. This might grow six to 12 inches a year, but the branches are nice and flexible. So if it gets heavy snow, the branches tend to just droop down. They won't break off, um, but it has a bluer, kind of a blue sheen to it. Soft needles, a uh, good little plant. American yellowwood. Now this is one that's not common, not used. It is sold in nurseries. We have some of them in our garden and it'll have a showy white flower in, this, in the early, early summer. And then it's fragrant. It has um, kind of a neat structure, nice leaf color. The one downside is it may have a little bit of included bark, meaning as the joints grow, the, the bark can get kind of down inside there. But we have, with the trees we have here in our garden, we've not seen any problems with that, especially because we're pruning some of the weird joint. When they're small, you can shape these a little bit and prune them. 
Um, but I think they're a cool tree. I think they're underused and I think they're a great tree. Also really nice yellow fall color. So they're great, great for that. Common alder, not again, another tree that's not really seen too much, but it's a great, it's a good tree. Um, moderate growth rate, medium size, it tolerates moist soils, a little bit like the river birch, not quite, not quite as much, um, but can be a great, like a great landscape tree. I, I wanted to grow an alder, um, but I seem to so like this one may be a little harder to find, and I'm not sure why, because it's a great landscape tree. Um, if you see one in maturity, they look great. They're just a really nice looking tree, a nice looking leaf, but uh, for whatever reason, they're not as well, they're just not as grown. Uh, growers maybe aren't growing or maybe they just didn't sell as much so their other varieties are, are what you see mostly in the nursery. Columnar English oak. Now I've talked about a few columnar varieties. So this the leaves stay on the tree into late winter with some of these oaks. Red oak is a little bit the same way. Um, but if you're looking for a good strong upright columnar variety, some people grow poplars because they get tall and columnar. Um, the reason they grow those is they're also fast. A, an oak is a slow to medium grower, but longevity, it's gonna be much, much greater. You're gonna have a lot longer life on them. They're gonna be stronger. They're not gonna be shedding the twigs and the, and the leaves and all the junk. I mean, they're gonna have leaves, but all the broken stuff um, that the poplars would have, if you need a columnar row of trees or some sort of specimen of a columnar tree, um, a columnar oak is a great tree to, to use for that. And then next is European hornbeam. And it is more a little more upright as well. It kind of fits into the columnar category, although the picture at the bottom there shows it quite wide. The picture at the top is more of what I think is the European hornbeam. It's a little tighter in my opinion. We've grown some of these and they tend to stay smaller, but you know, again, every tree's sites are a little different you may get a little bit of a broadening, um, but it still provides more of an upright growth, good for screening, um, very dense, good tree. Hornbeams are a good, you know, a good tree with very little problems. It does say that one, one characteristic is you may get a little bit of die back depending on the severity of the winter if it's not in the right zone. Um, a, a little bit of a specimen tree is a, a blue atlas cedar. And a blue atlas cedar, you've seen these, some of them are upright, some of them are weeping. I've, I've shown two pictures here, one of them upright form, one weeping form. These can be medium to large and, you know, sometimes they kind of look like some sort of sea monster or something. The weeping ones are really bent over and you know, almost like something coming out of the sea and it's covered in seaweed or something. Um, but more of a specimen, it's just to highlight or showcase a, a point of interest. You can put those in and, and it, it does draw the eye because it's so unique and so different that the people are gonna look at it. Um, so good tree, does well in our climate. I'm going through these very quickly. So again, if there's questions, use the Q&A button, um, type in your questions. If there's you know things, I, I hope we're covering what you're hoping to see. So on large trees, now again, this is not a comprehensive list. I've just tried to throw a bunch on here that, that are common, fairly common to our area. They're gonna provide the large structures, shade. Um, so we'll just go through those. Again, you have the growth rate, the mature size, the longevity and the crown shade to help you there. And so this list here is slightly different than this just quick look. Um, there's a couple extras on here that I've added. So some of these don't have any description on them. Um, whoops, let me go back. Um, so we've got a ginkgo and I'll show you, some of these may repeat, uh, like I mentioned. So we've got a ginkgo, a great large tree. It is known as one of the oldest types of, oldest species of trees that still exists, you know, from the dinosaur era, where it has a very unique different leaf to it and it doesn't, it doesn't have any pests or diseases that are known. It's just an all around good, strong tree with no problems that are really known. Now that doesn't mean it couldn't develop something or some sort of bug becomes adapted to you know, eat it or whatever, but what a great tree. It, it's just a good tree to use. English oak, good, strong oak. You know, oaks are known because they're just strong wood. You know, you, 
make oak furniture. You know, there's oak products, everything for the nature. There's a strong wood tree. It's a good hard wood, large, big structure. You know, it's the kind of kind of tree that's you, know, you put a tree house in because it's just structurally big. It's sound. It's big, rounded canopy. Um, it does produce an acorn. That's all oaks will, um, but it's a good strong tree. Green ash and Marshall seedless ash. So ashes are beautiful trees. The one downside, and I'm gonna, I think I have another picture of an ash coming up, is ash, ashes were used a lot, and there's the emerald ash borer that can be a problem. A borer is a bug that bores into the tree and eats inside the bark in the cambium layers of the tree, which in a severe case will kill the tree. Um, and ash borers are a problem now. And so a lot of people have just steered completely away from ash trees because of the borer problem. Um, I still think they're a great tree. You do risk having a tree grow up, getting a few years of maturity, and then borers attacking that tree. The way to get rid of borers, if, and there's other borers for other types of trees as well. Bores are hard to get rid of because they're inside. There's no spray that gets to them. Usually you have to use a systemic pesticide, which means it's something that's actually applied and watered into the ground. The tree then takes that chemical into the tree itself and into the conductive tissues up the tree. And as that bore is eating inside the tree, it takes in some of the, the pesticide and kills the bug. But that, that's a lot of work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so anyway, if you have borer problems on certain trees, birches can get borers, the birch borer, um, aspens have a problem with borers and, and then others, but ashes, that's the one downside to an ash. I've already showed you American yellowwood. I, it was in the medium, it's also in the large here because it's kind of a medium to large tree, but just a different picture, different kind of you know, angle. I think it's a good tree, I like them. London plane tree, also known as the sycamore. Now, these pictures show this is a little bit smaller. Um, a London plane tree is a very large tree. Now, depending on where you live, um, some older neighborhoods, older areas have nice mature examples of these. Brigham City, along the main street in Brigham City, you'll see some very, some nice mature London plane trees. Um, in Farmington, in the old main street in Farmington, you'll see some old, mature London plane trees. They have kind of a unique peeling bark, um, some interesting characteristic there, and they're just big, nice overhanging trees. They're 50 to 60 feet tall, 50 feet wide, um, just really a big leaf. They do produce a funny little seed pod, as you see in that picture, um, that, that flowers. They can have a few little problems like um, anthracnose or some other, other issues, but um, anyway, Pretty good tree for a large tree. Nice branching structure, good shape. Um, horse chestnut or northern catalpa, both I think are very attractive trees. They're just big. The horse chestnut in the picture at the bottom, you see the fruit on those. It produces this little spiny, a spiny coating. And inside there, there is a nut, um, often referred to as a buckeye, but it's not the chestnuts that you would roast, um, you know, roasted chestnut or anything like that. But it has a really cool flower that goes upward. I've seen there's pink ones and white ones. Big, nice shade tree. Um, I don't know of any problems. Catalpas, really attractive trees. The downside is the, the pods. It can produce those seed pods that can be you know, 12 or 18 inches long. <clears throat> as kids, we used them as swords. You know, what else do you do with these giant seed pods? You, you sword fight with them. So kids, of course, love them because they run around playing and beating each other with those seed pods. Um, but if, if that's a problem, you know, you have the pods dropping, the seed, you know, some of that. The flowers are beautiful though. The catalpa in general is a beautiful tree. Some people like to pollard them, meaning they cut them really low. They cut everything down and then you see just this tuft of very large green leaves. Um, so, there are things you can do to keep them smaller, but it's a lot of work year to year to do that. Zilkova is a large tree. Oftentimes, interesting enough, this could probably fit into the more the medium tree as well. Um, <clears throat> sometimes they'll use these under power lines because it already has a vase shape. And there's a couple cu um, cultivations or varieties of Zilkova 
that are meant to be under power lines because they will actually come short. They'll be shorter. They'll never get up into the power lines. And our vase-shaped tree, very adaptable, very tolerant. Um, again, though, because of the vase shape, they can get a little bit of included bark, meaning the bark grows together in the joints. <coughs> But and if you like the vase shape, they have some pretty decent yellow to orange fall color. Um, so overall, a pretty good tree. <clears throat> and then burr oak, uh, just another big oak. If you're planning on growing an oak, you, other than gamble oak, our local gamble oak that you see in the foothills is a smaller oak, uh, more tolerant of, of dry. Uh, but if you're buying an oak from the nursery, with the exception of columnar varieties, most of them are just very large trees. They're gonna be in the 50 to 60 foot range. Some of them even say to 80 feet tall. Um, <clears throat> most of the oaks though are pest free, they're adaptable. Burr oak is especially adaptable to our alkaline soils. Our soils change across the country. So if, if you're used to living back east, the soils are very acidic. You know, the, the swamp white oaks and some of those that do better in the more moist, they get a lot more water, just the, the acidic soil conditions. A burr oak is really more suitable for our, our soils here. Uh, some of the other oaks grow just fine, but as far as the oaks go, we'll probably most often see burr oak. If you see a big oak growing, it's probably burr oak. Northern red oak is another option. Um, the leaf's a little different. I showed a picture of the leaf, it's just a strong, tight, you know, kind of sharper points on the, on the leaf. Brilliant, nice color. We have one here in the garden of red oak. Um, the leaves do hang on for quite a long time going into winter. They'll kind of go red and then they'll go brown and they just kind of hang on the tree for quite a while. Slow grower, large tree, um, nice, again, good, good strong structure. Lindens, little leaf linden, a large tree, moderate growth, pyramidal in shape. It's, it's fairly adaptable. It can get some aphids um, from time to time. It does have a fragrance. And then I didn't include all of the other lindens. There's several other lindens in, the, in here that you might consider. There's a silver linden, has a nice, on the underside of it, has kind of a silvery sheen. And so, in it, and it's more upright, not quite so pyramidal in shape, kind of a broad pyramid. The silver linden is more upright, large again. There's, um, there's several other linden varieties that can be large. Larger leaf, the little leaf linden actually does have a small leaf, whereas some of your other lindens have a, a very large leaf. Um, nice looking trees, good trees for landscape. They do kind of produce, uh, they, don't, they don't have a showy flower, but you can tell when it's flowering because it is fragrant. And then they do kind of produce a little seed, a little seed thing there that's not, it's not messy. Per se. I mean, all of them have a little bit of a mess, maples, some of those, but not, um, not anything that you wouldn't be dealing with with any other type of tree. Um, here's one that's very less, less known, European larch, medium to large, um, spring foliage and fall color, moist, shady, interesting tree. I don't know much about these, but um, I had, some, had this much information on it, so I decided to throw it in here. I took a little bit from a couple other presentations we've done and throw them in here. Um, this one may be a little harder to find here, so we won't spend a lot of time on it. Hackberry, for our climate, this is, this is one that's considered to be a very water-wise, very adaptable tree. Um, strong growth. It, it's faster, but it's not weak wooded. Uh, so in the growth rate, it's fast, but not as weak. The, it'll get some interesting things though that some people get a little panicked on them. Um, it, it, it gets a gall. It's called, it's a hackberry, hackberry leaf gall. And it forms these little bumps. It's a little bug in there that, that actually is a kind of a symbiotic thing. It doesn't hurt the tree, but it forms these funny little nodules on the leaves, uh, just a little gall on them. So they're sometimes unsightly on the bottoms of the, or on those leaves. But up in the tree, you can't even see them. But if you're down low, you can see some of those on the leaves. Um, but otherwise, it doesn't, doesn't really have any problems. We've got some of them here in the garden as well that are fairly mature. Um, but a big tree, very water-wise, very adaptable to some more uh, harsher soil conditions, your poorer soil conditions, some of that. <clears throat> I already talked about ginkgo. It was in the last section too. 
but I've thrown it in here too. So ginkgo, again, just a good medium to large tree, slow growth, good fall color. Oh, this reminds me though, there are what male and female trees, ginkgo trees, and usually they're pollinators, they pollinate each other. So nurseries know this, but you'd want to plant a male tree if you plant a female tree, it will flower and produce fruit and it will stink. Um, it will drop fruit and it's really bad. So most nurseries only are selling, they, they will only sell the male variety of this tree. Um, but that's something you would maybe double check with and ask because the you would have a, a kind of a mess and a stink if you use the female ginkgo. Um, sweet gum. Now, this one I showed a picture earlier about the characteristics. Sweet gum is a great tree. Um, you don't see a lot of them in our climate. It's a zone five, moderate growth rate, good fall color. Um, it needs better drainage, and it does produce that little spiny fruit. So some people call it the gum ball, but it's a, it's a very hard structured little seed pod, as you see in that picture at the bottom. Um, if you like to make crafty things, some people have made things out of those seed pods where you just glue them together, you do things with them. Um, kind of interesting, not real messy, but those will fall. You'd run them over with your lawnmower or if you're out in bare feet and step on one of those, you would know it. Um, so that's something to consider, but really nice tree. The, the star-shaped leaf, really, I like these trees. I think they do well. I don't think they're used enough here. But the downside is probably that little spiny seed pod that will fall on the ground is probably why they're not used. Um, as far as a large evergreen, now you've seen large evergreens. The you know the Austrian pine is a big pine tree. Um, Douglas firs. There's lots of there's several fir varieties. There's several pine varieties. Um, there's white fir. There's Fraser fir. I'm, I've chosen just to use white fir here. It's a large, a very large but very nice, um, upright, conical-shaped evergreen. Very soft needled. It's a water-wise tree. We have one of these growing in the garden that's fairly mature now. I think it's probably 20 feet tall. Um, they're a fairly fast grower, considering that they're gonna be still strong. Um, it's a fir tree. Fir, one thing to know too, if you, fir trees are soft, like fir, you can you know, rubber cross them, like you say you're petting your dog, it's, it's soft. Pines tend to have a more rigid, pokey nature, you know, and spruces. Spruces also are very spiny. Blue spruce, you cannot go pet the blue spruce. It's going to be very spiny and pokey. So that's kind of one of the different, how do you differentiate between some of your spruces and your firs is the, the nature and the softness of the needles. Uh, but white fir is an overall good tree, but big. It, if you grow white fir, expect that thing to mature at about 50 feet tall. Um, they use white fir and Fraser fir and some of those. If you cut them small, they're used as Christmas trees and, and they're beautiful. Some beech, a beech tree. There's a few varieties of beeches. There's some purple varieties. Um, there's some cultivations of beech trees, but it's a large tree, slow grower. It, it, it's actually slower than many, but it's very, it's a stately tree. Um, leaf color is what it's grown for, the leaf texture good and strong, not a lot of pests or problems. You've maybe heard of a tricolor beech. They're a little bit smaller. It's a cultivation of this where it actually has multiple colors on the leaves, kind of the purples to pink, sometimes a little bit of white variegation in them. Um, tricolor beeches are, are kind of been popular for smaller trees. They won't get as large as, this, as the true species of beech, um, but beeches are, can be a great strong stately tree too for just a nice look in your yard. Now, many of you maybe don't have room for these, or you have these and you know, you're just wondering about them. But if you're, if you're interested in growing large trees, do the homework, make sure and do just a little bit of extra homework on the tree you've selected, uh, because you do wanna make sure that what you planted, you don't, 10 years from now, you don't regret and say, oh, I wish I would have planted, because you don't wanna lose 10 years of growth and, and have a tree you know, that's starting to get a little bit of size to it. Tulip trees are also a pretty unique kind of cool trees. Um, they're zone four, large, fast grower, flower. They do produce a flower as I picked, put in the picture there. Um, they can be a little bit weak, would not, not so much like a willow or cottonwood or some of those, 
um, but, but because they're fast, they're weaker than some. Um, but they, they have that kind of unique flower that I think some people thought it looked like a, a little bit like a tulip and so that got its name, the tulip tree. Um, Cedar of Lebanon. Um, this will grow here. <clears throat> um, it's a zone five, it's large, it's a moderate growth rate, kind of just, I mean, you can see from that picture, a little different look, um, very stately and graceful. I don't know what else to say about this, but, you know, I guess scripturally, if you, you know, you just think of Old Testament times or whatever, there's cedar of Lebanon is mentioned. It's, it's not a native to here, but it grows here and it does quite well here. Um, it, it's just a, enough different and unique, but very large. But if you had the space, it would just be a cool addition. Another one is Don Redwood, uh, Metasequoia tree. It, it grows well here. And even the regular redwood, um, you can actually grow redwood trees here. They won't get to be like the giant redwoods in the redwood forest, but um, they can be large trees. They can, they can grow in our climate. They can do well. Um, and now redwoods are kind of what's considered a deciduous conifer, somewhat similar to, um, oh, it just left me. Anyway, there's a couple of these categories of deciduous conifers where they actually turn brown and shed their, leaves, shed their needles in the winter time and then they regrow those needles in the spring. So if you were unfamiliar with that, you'd think your whole tree was dead, um, but it's not. So you know, you'd wanna just make sure you understand on some of these that have how they grow and how they work or else you would panic a little bit and take it out before it, before it regrew in the next spring. So it does have a little bit of fall color, even though it is a, um, a conifer type tree, it produces a little cone. So shade loving tolerant trees, We'll get into these real quick and then um, running out of time quickly. Um, so here's a, just a list of a few shade loving and tolerant trees. Hey Dave. Yes. Really fast. Would you just answer a quick question about quaking aspens while you're on big trees? Sure. Is it and whether you like them or not. <laughs> oh, so okay. So I don't, okay, it's not this typed question. Um, aspens. Aspens are great in the mountains. <laughs> That's what I would say. No, I think they're beautiful trees. They're good trees. In the valleys, I think what happens, you bring them down to lower elevation with a little extra heat in the different urban settings, is aspens may stress a little, depending on the water, depending on the soils. Um, and then when stressed, they're more susceptible to have borer problems. And what, what usually happens is they'll have a few years of growth, so you start to get a little size, and then they die. It's not that they're dying when they're little, they're dying when they're finally big enough that you're loving them. Now, it didn't, I don't think it used to be as much of a problem, but it, it, as time goes on, it seems that people that grow aspens just have more and more problems with them. Not only with the borers, but then aspens in the mountains are like one giant organism. One grove of aspens is technically all connected together as they send roots and sucker and send up new trees. So, you can you can potentially have problems if you have a little grove of them if one of them is sick they all get sick and then in a landscape because of the nature of them wanting to do that you tend to end up with little aspen seedlings or suckerings coming up in your lawn and coming up in your garden and coming up in other places and then you're wondering wait a minute i keep chopping this thing off and it keeps growing and now i've got this big knobby root so generally speaking um, I would say leave aspens in the in the mountains and look for another tree with a similar characteristic. If it's the upright, if it's the shimmering leaves, a silver linden kind of gives you the shimmering leaves. If it's the white bark you love, there are the white birches that, that kind of have that white bark that are probably, they also have some borer problems, but maybe less so. Um, anyway, Janice, any other thoughts? Nope, I think that's it. Thanks. Okay. Carry on. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll keep going here for a minute and just keep asking questions, type them in. Janice will try to address those and we'll, we'll keep answering questions here when we get going uh, or kind of when we get to the end. Um, shade loving and, and tolerant trees, Janala maple, Japanese maple, full moon maple, service berry, horn, East, European horn, mean Eastern red bud, European beech and magnolia. These are all trees that can grow under other trees and, and still be okay. You get some really large trees, but you still need a short tree that gets a lot of shade. Um, the shade loving trees there. So let me see, what did I do? Okay, here we go. 
Now, I've got a few slides here again that are a little text heavy. I'm gonna just skim through these. But specimen trees, just so you, just kind of a definition, is one that is unusual or impressive as it grows and it's a focal point. Anything can be a specimen tree, but there are some that just have unique characteristics enough that they're your showpiece. So you put a specimen tree where it really makes a statement of, you know, here, look at me, look at this, look at this cool thing. So if you don't have that kind of a setting and you're not worried about that, then don't worry about specimen trees. Some trees are marketed in the nursery of, hey, a great specimen tree. Um, so I've listed a few more. There's a few more. Well, no, sorry, I, those were shade trees. A few specimen trees could be the contorted filbert, Japanese maple, any of the weeping spruces or pines, um, any of the weeping cherries, any, you know, cedar of Lebanon, the golden deodor cedar, columnar blue spruces, um, magnolias, paper bark maples. There's a bunch, and they're even the, um, like, I want to say the, it's this, Rose of Sharon as a tree form where they've kind of grafted it and make, that can be a specimen tree, even though it's gonna be 10 feet tall or something. Um, anything that you find unique or beautiful makes a centerpiece. Now really, we're gonna kind of transition into some characteristics of treating or caring for trees and planting the trees. Um, your soil conditions are gonna play a large role of, of success. If you don't plant them right from the beginning, you may set yourself up for failure and struggle five years from now. So it's the drainage, the compaction, um, how, how the soil is, we've already talked about. Um, and then knowing the soil texture will kind of help you in preparing for and getting ready to plant this tree. Ideally, when you plant a tree, you should dig your hole wider than the root ball, but not deeper. So often it's recommended dig your hole twice as big. Now, we've all, well, I've planted trees and because you're in a hurry and the ground is hard or something's happening, you're like, I'm, there's no way I'm digging this twice as big. So you dig it just a little bit bigger than the size of the, the pot. And so you can slide, you can get the plant out of the pot or out of the root ball or the ball and burlap and you can put it in the hole and then you can bury it, right? Ideally, you're doing that so it loosens the soil to the side enough so as this tree starts taking off, it's easy for those branch, easy for those roots to get into the soil in the side and start rooting in into the natural soil and get growing and established. If the soils are hard and you simply dig a little hole, a container, you're essentially just making a pot for that pot, potted tree to sit in. And if it gets really saturated, sometimes clay soils, you've only created a pot and now that tree just sits in this little pot, so to speak, in the ground and it doesn't do anything. It takes a long time for that to break out and sometimes the roots just swirl around inside there without growing into the native soil. So loosening the soil, breaking it up a little bit wider but not deeper will help you get, get established. Now um, placing the tree. You want to place the tree at the bottom of the hole, ideally on undisturbed soil, trunk upright, making sure your root collar is the same level of the ground. Now the root collar is where the trunk comes down and it'll flare at the bottom a little bit. Do I have a picture of that? No. Um, so sometimes nurseries get it wrong too and they've, they've got some trees and they've been potted too deeply. The root flare, where it flares down, is actually buried maybe four or five inches under soil in a pot. Well, when you plant that tree, if, if you see just trunk going straight into the ground, like this picture here where on, with the, the arrow and the yellow line, if you don't see somewhat of a flare, now this is a, not a good picture, this is showing something else, but in a pot, when you see that, if it's just going straight in, dig that soil around a little bit until you see that little bit of flaring, it'll widen out just a little bit, and that's where the soil level should be. The flare should come out, soil level right at the root flare. And if there's ropes, wires, tags, any, anything around that tree or around the roots, you got to get that off. Eventually that'll girdle the tree, it'll grow around it. It's not going to go away. Um, even burlap takes a very long time to break down. So ideally you're getting all that off. Um, you're trying to do that without disturbing the root ball itself and the root mass itself uh, as much as possible. So it says, you know, I wrote on here, if leaving half the burlap makes, makes slits in it or something so roots can get out of it. Um, but some, some contractors leave and plant the entire 
they'll have trees in a basket, bald and burlap trees in a metal basket. And they cut off the top of it and they stick the whole metal back down in there. Well, that metal doesn't really go away. I think some think it's going to rust and it's going to break apart. But what happens is if it's a very, if you're planting a very large tree that way, the, ro the roots on those things can get huge. And if you have these little square wire things, that wire can sometimes go right around, go, the roots go through it, and then you end up girdling the roots of your tree and you end up with problems down the road. So here's an example of a root that is, you know, this is a fairly large tree. The roots grown out of the soil. It, you can see it's wrapped around the trunk. It's, it's, that root itself is almost girdling the main trunk of the tree, which is going to lead to problems. It can lead to weakening. It can lead to stress. It can lead to bug issues uh, because that's not how it's supposed to be, right? You're not supposed to have a weird root wrapped around your trunk of your tree. But that was an issue because of at planting, roots were swirling. They continued to grow and now you have a big root that you, you can't do much. I mean, you could cut that off maybe part of it or something. Um, but it, when planting, it's just a good idea to make sure everything's done right. When you plant, you're gonna save yourself a lot of headache and a lot of potential problems five or so years down the road when that thing starts to actually get a little bit size. So um, backfilling, once you've got the tree in that hole, backfill the hole to the original layer, uh, original, Thing. Again, the root flare should be at that soil level, right at ground level, okay? Um, you don't need to jump up and down to hammer and compact all that soil in. Ideally, you, you loosely compact it, um, but you don't really need to pack it in there tightly. So lightly put the soil in, water it in, it'll settle the soil around the root ball, it'll get everything nice and moist out into the native soil so roots can start growing out. Um, if your clay is, if, you, if you're planting in really heavy clay, some say dig that hole wider, mix the clay, your natural clay, with a little bit of composted or, or you know, some sort of soil amendment and put it back in. Then your tree has a gradual moving from its potted potting soil out into natural more clay and then into the heavier clay and eventually getting out and established. All right. Hopefully that addresses some of the planting concerns. If you're, you know, you're thinking of trees, you wonder how to plant them, best to do. Now here's the season to plant. You wanna plant when things are dormant, but you're thinking, well, wait, right now is when I need to plant. I, I'm going to the nursery, I see these. You can plant trees anytime. Um, ideally it's when they're dormant, but right now you go to the nursery and you buy the tree. Um, you can plant them anytime. The, the problem is in the middle of the summer, in the hottest part of the year, you're gonna to have to really watch the water. And it's just not too much, but not too little because the tree could dry out because again, all the roots have been cut off. If it's bald and burlap, it's got cut roots. If it's in a pot, it's used to being in this little teeny pot, um, watered every day in the nursery. So just really watch um, the watering. If you can, ideally you plant in the spring and the fall because it's just cooler. So the soils are generally hold the moisture longer. It's cooler, you don't have to water them as often. Um, if you do bare root trees, they can only be planted in the spring when they're dormant. If it leaves out, it's going to be much more of a struggle. A lot of people plant bald and burlap, or excuse me, bare root fruit trees, and they ship those early. They, you got to plant them when they're dormant. There's no leaves on them. It's a very little. It's a good way to go if you know what you're doing, um, but it can only happen in the springtime. And now let's talk about follow-up maintenance. Um, water, of course, is the tree's greatest need at planting. And then going forward, once a tree gets established, watering, especially if there's water around it, like I mentioned, if it's around lawn or if it's other areas, the trees usually get enough and they can actually move water through their tissues, through their systems to, to feed and, and take care of the rest of the tree. Um, you wanna thoroughly water new trees, letting it soak in, and then um, don't pack down the wet soils around them. There needs to be trees, all these plants need some air exchange. So if it's really tight, really compacted, always saturated with water, there's no air, carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange, even in the root zone. Some people don't think of that, but their soil is still porous. There can be air movement through the soils. So you don't want that so packed and so tight that none of that can happen because then you limit the gas exchanges and, and your trees just don't do as well. Um, apply water as often as needed, you know, to keep, a new tree moist long enough, but not saturated. And then, um, as I mentioned, don't overwater the tree. 
so many people kill new trees from overwatering and they don't realize just what I mentioned. They've saturated the root zone. That root, the roots are simply sitting almost in water, just suffocating. There's no air exchange, there's nothing happening and the trees are simply drowning. Very, very, very common, very prominent thing that happens on new trees and sometimes even older trees. Fertilization, don't fertilize new trees. Um, it can, it can decrease root growth. It causes the crown to grow too much and you, know, you get an imbalance. So don't fertilize your brand new trees. Root stimulator or hormones or other products have been beneficial. So sometimes the nurseries will say, oh, do you need root stimulator with that? Well, if you want, but it's not necessary, you can save your money and just put it in the ground. Trees are, trees are amazing and they'll, they'll do their thing. If you have really terrible soils, then maybe you wanna use a little root stimulator um, just to help get additional roots growing, get it started into the soil and, and started to get established. And then um, you should only do fertilization um, uh, probably a couple of years. Uh, you know, the, the basically says finally fertilization should only be done after a tree has recovered from planting. So the first year you don't even probably need to fertilize. It could be two to three years, maybe even longer. But if, if, if your tree is growing just fine, then there's really no reason to worry about fertilization anyway. It's just if you start to see problems, yellowing leaves, you know, weird growth issues, or it just doesn't seem to be growing at all, maybe it's fertilizer, but more likely it's probably some other issue with soils or something else that's happening. So you'd want to kind of take a look at the, the other factors as well. Fertilization is not always the, the thing that it needs. Um, I'm gonna, mulching is just simply, um, you don't necessarily need to, mulching is just to help keep weeds down around a, a tree, um, it's to keep moisture in the tree, but you don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to worry too much about that. Um, apply wood chips, other organic mulch, a couple inches around the tree, but don't pile it up around. Don't make a mulch volcano around the trunk of a tree. It can attract bugs. It can, it can create problems. So keep, a keep the bark a little bit lower right at the crown of the tree, uh, away from the trunk. And then one other thing while we're on mulching, is if you're planting in lawn, ideally create a tree well, trim the, trim the grass back away from that tree so you don't have to use your string trimmer and you're not damaging that tree with your mower. If you damage the, the trunk, the, the cambium layers, it will damage the tree and it won't grow as well. And you can even kill a tree from damaging those cambium layers with a string trimmer or with your mower. So ideally put the tree in the ground, you've dug the hole for it, but as grass tends to grow back in, keep that grass back away a couple feet ideally from the trunk of the tree. It'll save you on maintenance time, but it'll also save you from damaging your tree. And then pruning. Um, pruning is always an, a question and always an issue. I've got a couple little slides here um, to show, show some of the cuts. There's always the general pruning rules. You can remove dead and diseased and crossing branches anytime. You don't need to wait and have the tree expend energy and lose a whole season of growth and stuff. If you see something going wrong, prune it out whenever you see it, a little. But if there's major things, prune when the tree is dormant. Um, just like fruit trees, prune it in the early spring. Don't prune in the fall. Pruning does stimulate growth. So don't prune it late because then it's trying to grow as it should be trying to shut down and heal everything. Um, so, at the time of pruning, you probably don't need to do a lot of pruning. But since some young trees from a nursery, they've all been tied together. If there's some weird branches in there, cut those off, prune them out, just make just a few cuts um, to, to tidy it up. And then just usually wait till the following spring and then do some of the, the pruning that needs to be done. Once trees are established, always dead, diseased, rubbing, crossing branches to remove. If you have terrible joint structure somewhere or a branch that's just kind of shooting off weird to make your structure weird, prune that one out. Here's the type of, of cuts you would make. Heading cuts are where you simply cut across a branch like shown on the left. Thinning cuts are where you take a, a branch all the way back down to the next joint structure. Now heading cuts stimulate growth. So if you cut it off right across there, it's going to shoot off lots of new branches and growth. So if you have a little teeny skinny tree that just doesn't have a lot of growth outward, you can cut a main branch, do a heading cut, and it'll start stimulating outward branches. 
But if you just keep cutting heading cuts, all it does is make the top very dense, lots of little branches, and you keep cutting, you keep cutting, very dense, very unsightly structure on top of a tree. Now, if you're hedging, you have a hedge, that's what you want. You hedge it off and then it gets really thick and full and you keep hedging at that same depth level and it gets really thick because all those little branching things happen and it gets thick. Most ornamental trees, you don't want that. So to shape a tree, to structure a tree, do a thinning cut. Take it all the way back down to that main branch or whatever next branch and then trim it there, cut a nice clean cut and that will eliminate that branch. And so you can shape and direct a tree through mostly thinning cuts um, to get the direction you want to go. Here's some tree forms. Um, if your tree, if a lot of trees are just ornamental trees, or especially, they're very central leader driven. It means just one nice big stem and then branches off of that main leader. Um, if you want to change the shape of a tree, you can remove a central leader and then it becomes modified or a vase shape. Any tree can be trained. You can train and shape but the natural characteristics of some of these trees is some of them just simply want to be upright. So you can keep pruning and pruning and, and you know, you may grow out and then up, but you would want to, you know, think about the shape of your tree. And if, if you want it just to be natural, you let the tree just do its thing. And then you're only pruning out the dead, the diseased or the dying things um, to keep a tree healthy and keep it more its natural shape. But like I said, if a tree has some weird branch that starts taking off, it's just, completely different and messing up your form, well prune it, shape it up and get it how you want it to grow because you're ultimately in charge of the shape of your tree. So <clears throat> with that, um, here's a few resources and then we'll get to some questions and we'll you know, maybe go over a couple more things. We're almost out of time. Um, just a few books. USU Extension has some great things on trees. They've got great people that have studied trees. The treebrowser.org that I showed you. Um, and then, you know, there's with the internet now with Google searches and everything else, there are so many things you can find. And then just visiting nurseries without the intent to even buy. Sometimes just wandering around nurseries, looking at what they have, reading some of the tags, asking the people at the nursery. I know some of the, some of the nurserymen, the tree guides, they've been at some of these nurseries for years and their knowledge is fantastic on trees and, you know, the tree characteristics, how they grow, what you should do. Um, so there's some really good people and resources out there. So with that, I think we're, we're at questions. Um, Janice, you've been addressing questions. What do I need to address verbally? Yeah, uh, there's just a few that I haven't gotten to yet. So we might as well just do them as a group. Um, one person asked, how do you keep grass away from the tree if it has already grown around the trunk? Just oh, dig it out. Yes, great question. So depending on the age of the tree, um, you, yes, the short answer is simply dig it out. The, the downside to that is you don't want to damage a lot of roots digging right there. So you can very carefully, I would take, if, if you don't want to dig it, but you want to kill the grass, take some sort of a shield, a piece of cardboard or something that's tall enough, slide it down the trunk of a tree, and then you can spray Roundup at the base of that and it'll kill all that grass without affecting the tree. Now, if your tree has root suckers coming out the bottom, you spray those, that will affect your tree because it's gonna draw that down into the roots. But as long as there's no root suckers or anything like that, you can slide as something to protect the tree, spray with Roundup, it'll kill the grass, and then you can kind of dig it out or whatever afterwards. But digging is usually the easiest and you know, simple way to do it. But be careful in damaging your trunk. Now, if it's a more mature tree with thick bark, you almost don't even need to worry about the roundup affecting the tree. You can just spray very carefully around the tree. If a little bit gets on the thick bark, it's not gonna affect the tree. I've done that on some big pines. I've got a couple big pines in my yard. I just sprayed around them. Trees are just fine. It killed the grass around, so I don't have to worry about string trimming or mowing. So I hope, I hope that answers that. If not, do us a follow-up question and we'll, we'll get to it. Um, did you answer this one about the pecan tree? Mm-mm, no? nope. Okay. You'd like to find a pecan tree, um, only bear root through online growers. Any recommendations? Sadly, no. Um, sometimes, this brings up a great question from Angela, that um, sometimes you will find something that you'd really like to have, but for whatever reason, you can't find it at a local nursery. There's really nothing wrong with doing a, a bear root tree from online. 
I've been very successful. I, I planted like 11 fruit trees because you want specific things. You can't always find them. Um, and I did them bare root and all of them grew. All of them been very successful. So I'm not afraid of telling you to go ahead and go online and find a tree you want if you can't find it locally. At least if you're comfortable with bare root and you understand what that is, I would do that because um, you're absolutely right. Sometimes you want something, you know it's out there, but for whatever reason, you just can't find it locally, certainly go online. I don't have any other recommendations unless you can ask the nursery. They, they sometimes won't be able to find it or get it that year. But if you know and you go to a specific nursery that you love to shop at and say, look, I really want a pecan tree. Here's the variety I want. Can you get it for me? If they say yes, we'll bring it in next spring. And sometimes they'll do that by asking them. Sometimes they will find the growers and bring those trees in. Um, but that's the only other thing I can suggest. Um, next one, is there supposed to be more pictures about pruning? Sorry, I, <laughs> um, there, were, there were only a couple little diagram pictures. Um, there were, if you didn't see those, I skipped through them really quick. It was just on the pruning cuts, a heading cut and a thinning cut, and then pruning shapes. You, you got your central leader, your modified leader, and so forth. So if you didn't see those, there wasn't really much to see, just illustration of types of pruning cuts. Um, so hopefully you saw those, but there were no other actual images. And we do teach pruning classes every spring. So I, do we have some up on our website, Dave? From yeah, there should be spring? a pruning class. There should be a pruning class presentation. It, the pruning classes we've done this year were more, more focused on fruit trees, but the principles generally still apply. All your basic cuts and how to prune. The only difference with fruit trees is you're worried about where to prune so you'll get fruit. With ornamentals, you're only worried about structure and shape. You know, you want good branch structure, you want this nice shape, so you don't have to worry about where the blossoms are on an ornamental. I mean, although you could prune off all the blossoms one year, maybe on a crab apple or something, maybe, um, but you're not worried so much about that. But the principles are the same, so yes, you could find that online. Um, next one, do I need to fertilize a service berry tree? Um, short answer would probably be no, but it depends. Um, that one's a hard one because I don't know what that tree looks like. I don't know how old it is or where it is. Generally speaking, you shouldn't need to. Janice, any thoughts on that one? No, service berry trees are native to Utah and they don't require a lot of fertilizer or organic matter in the soil even. So I don't think that you need to like fertilize it more than what you're just generally doing for the rest of your yard. The next one. Um, if a tree is leaning, is that a sign that it's time to take it down? Um, if a replacement tree is planted, how close to the initial tree site can I plant it? Um, I imagine you're talking about a fairly mature tree. Just because it's leaning doesn't mean it needs to come down. It depends on the type of tree, um, site location. If it is leaning over a structure and you're worried that a wind might bring it down, then yes, that's a consideration. That maybe, maybe it's time to cut that down and replace it. Um, there's, there's a lot of factors I would say in that. If I have a tree that's just a little bit leaning, if, it, if it's not a threat to anything, it just looks a little funny, that's a personal preference. It doesn't mean it needs to be cut down. If you decide to cut a tree down and plant a replacement tree, there's really no reason you can't plant it almost in the same location unless, unless you have some known viral or bacterial infection that caused the, the initial tree to be sick or some problem, as long, you'd need to get out the stump. I mean, it, it'd be hard to plant and dig where there's a high concentration of roots or something. But if you've got equipment, digging out a tree, removing the stump, re, you know, putting the soil back in, there's no reason that the, a new tree couldn't be planted back at almost the exact same location as the original tree. Now, if you're planting a new tree while trying to decide if taking out the other tree, give yourself plenty of room so that if, if branches are falling or something, you're not destroying your brand new tree as you're removing the old one. Any thoughts, Janice? Nope, I think that's good. Okay. Uh, that, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I had a leaning tree. I did decide to take it out, not because it was a threat, just because I didn't like the look of it, but otherwise I would have just left it. it, it there's no problem. Um, we just planted red chokecherry um, last Wednesday, 
Um, been watering once each day. Get a lot of rain last night. Will it be wait? Yes, it will be okay to wait for a few days. The the amount of rain, depending on I don't know where you live. Um, I have a little rain, little thermometer, thermometer, little weather thing at my house. <laughs> I have a thermometer. It told me how much it rained. Um, I have a little rain catch can and weather thing at my house. We had almost three quarters of an inch at my house last night. And then a couple of weeks ago, we had, you know, an inch. With this amount of rain, with the temperatures that are forecast, you can probably wait, I would say, probably all the way till the weekend before you need to water it again. Um, the temperature is only going to get in the 70s. That water will hold, unless you have really sandy soil that just drains the water away quickly, you're probably going to be fine for a few days for sure. I would even recommend that. If you start watering that, you're probably going to overwater. It'll just be really saturated. You need to, you need to allow a little time sometimes to, to dry, not completely dry out, but dry out enough that, that you know, the tree can just continue to do its thing without being constantly wet. So yes, please uh, hold off for a few days. See, are there any trees that are safe to plant near water lines? Um, short answer is no. <laughs> there are no safe trees. Although I'm not sure what you're referring to as water lines. Maybe type as a little follow-up. Um, there are, for let's say for our system, we've got a lot of water lines in the ground, hundreds of miles of water pipes. Most of those water pipes and water lines are sealed up so well you're not going to have root intrusion or any problems like that. And so that, you know, there's water lines everywhere and there's trees everywhere. The, um, she just clarified the main water line coming in from the street to the house. Okay. There's really no issues um, other than the fact that if you ever need to replace the water line, is a tree going to be right on top of it? The, the water line coming from your house, from the street to the house is they're deep. Well, they're deep enough to be below frost depth, so they're at a minimum of three. I think they're usually four to six feet deep um, coming into the house. And if you have a basement, they're deeper than that sometimes, just depending. And so if you plant a tree near that, the roots are not going to interfere with the water line. Um, if it's an older house, though, with a galvanized steel line or something, and, it, and you plant it close, there, there is a potential, I guess, a root could get big enough and start pushing on that line. That if it's if it's old enough and rusty, you could you could rupture something, break something. But now with the new poly type lines they're running and, and different stuff like that, um, usually no. But for the sake of potential replacement, if that ever had to be dug up, I would maybe plant a tree not on top of it or a few feet away from the water line. The roots can go around it, the small feeder roots, everything can go around or over the top. But your main structure, if you ever had to dig up that line you're not necessarily affecting the main part of the tree and, and the tree would survive. So I hope that, I hope that answers that question. So it looks like that's all. If there's a couple more questions that come in while I wrap this up, we'll address them. But otherwise, appreciate you joining us. Um, I right off, I forgot. Janice, what, what's our class next week? My brain just went. Um, we're gonna do a perennial class. It's gonna be perennials by design. So it's going to, we're going to walk through a bunch of different, um, like types of, of landscape styles, like English gardens versus low water versus naturalized versus, you know, like, I don't know, just stuff like that and talk about some plants that do really well in each of those situations. So, and then we'll just talk a little bit about perennials just in general, like how to find good perennials for your yard, how to plant them, how to maintain them. Um, common pests, stuff like that. Okay, thank you for reminding me. Sometimes my brain does that. It's just like completely blank. I'm all focused on trees and now I can't even remember what I'm doing next week. Um, one more question came about how deep do common hackberry roots grow? Um, they're thinking of planting it fairly close to an in-ground trampoline. That's a really good question. Um, for most of these trees, you'll have surface feeder roots that are fairly close to the surface, and then there are deeper anchoring roots. I'm not sure how fairly close means. Um, generally speaking, if there's some sort of a uh, enclosure, if your in-ground trampoline has an enclosure, which it typically does, so soil isn't going into that hole, you're probably going to be just fine. The roots will grow around that enclosure. Uh, if, they're, if they're there, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Now, if it's just, just a couple feet away, as that tree grows, hackberries can be, get pretty big. I would worry that 
too close, you're not going to get enough feeder roots on the one side. And depending which way winds blow or something, you may have an imbalance of rooting structure. But if you're several feet away, you know, you're going to get shade over the top eventually. And so, you know, you're probably going to be just fine. Any thoughts, Janice, on that? No, I think that's, that's yeah. good. I, I don't know that I would worry too much if you're several feet away. Um, actually, several feet, meaning if you're probably 10 feet away from that, or if you need to be closer to that, you, you'd actually probably be okay. Roots will grow around and they will go deeper. I wouldn't worry about hackberry roots necessarily going through stuff, metal edge, plastic edges or something like that. Although roots are amazing. And over time, if it was too close, they may push against whatever barrier is there, creating, creating some problems that way. But I'd give yourself at least enough distance knowing that the tree is going to grow, it's going to have a canopy, it's going to overhang enough to provide shade if that's what you're looking for, to give yourself just enough distance there to, so you don't end up with major problems down the road. Another question was, do we have many visitors to the garden? Short answer, um, depends on when. We have had many visitors. Currently now with the way the COVID situation was, we haven't had a lot of visitors. So please come, you're welcome to come visit the garden. It's looking beautiful. The garden is open to the public. And so we'd welcome any visitors. Um, you're, you're sure welcome to come. Right now, we, we get visitors. We'll have people coming and going. But I, I wouldn't say it's a, a high number, high volume. You're not, if you're planning to come and you're worried about running into a lot of people, you probably don't have to worry about that. You know, there's, people are coming and going all the time, but not high numbers all at the same time. Well, anyway, that, that wraps us up. We appreciate you joining us. We're thankful that you're you know, part of what we're doing. This, has been re this webinar is recorded. It'll be posted on our website. The slides, as I mentioned, will be posted on our website. And then we just hope you'll tune in next week. If you've got questions, though, you can always go to our Facebook page and you can ask some questions. You can follow us there, look at the schedule stuff, register for classes. And um, just a little warning, in July, we're probably going to take a little leave from some classes. It's kind of vacation period. A lot of people go. So we'll have a few weeks where we don't have classes. And then depending on how things go, we'll, we'll probably continue to do some online. And hopefully, we'll get back into some in-class type classes as well, but stay tuned for that and we'll let you know. With that, I guess we're done. Thanks for joining us.